Good afternoon. We're Team HapTech. My name is Anna. This is Zach, Nikki, and Brian. And we will be presenting our project, Tactile Feedback for Monopolar Electric Cautery in Minimally Invasive Surgery. So what is... Give me first here. <laughs> so what is Minimally Invasive Surgery? So minimally invasive surgery is a form of surgery in which the surgeon uses small incisions, approximately one centimeter in width. And through these incisions, the surgeon inserts long tools. The surgeon views the actual surgery from a television um, using a camera that is placed inside the body cavity. So laparoscopic surgery is one of the most common forms of minimally invasive surgery. It has many advantages over open surgery, including the lower risk of infection and shorter recovery time. However, it also has disadvantages. Here is an example of a laparoscopic electrocautery tool. It's very long in nature, and as a result, you lose a lot of the tactile cues that you would have with a shorter open surgery tool. Additionally, because the surgeon actually only views the surgery on a television screen, they are actually getting only a two-dimensional representation of a three-dimensional surgical field. And as a result, they lose a lot of the spatial awareness that they have with open surgery. So electrocautery is a common technique used in all surgeries. And it is, a, it is a technique that uses large amounts of electrical current to cut tissue or coagulate vasculature, so to stop blood flow. And our project focuses on monopolar electrocautery. This is in contrast to bipolar electrocautery, in which there's a very localized energy. However, in monopolar electrocautery, as you can see in the image, the current flows from the generator to the tooltip, where it burns in the body, and then the current dissipates through the body until reaching the ground pad and returning to the generator. You can see that there are two different modes of electrocautery in this video. So first, there is the cut mode, and then you will see the coagulation mode, which is used to coagulate blood vessels. There's a very high complication rate of monopolar electrocautery in laparoscopic surgery. So of 200 patients that go in for a laparoscopic surgery that, that they use actual monopolar electrocautery in, one of these patients is going to leave with some type of unnecessary injury that resulted due to an accident. So we want to find a way of minimizing the complication rate. And one of the biggest reasons that there's such a high complication rate is because the electrocautery tool is transferring energy to another tool it is in contact with and is actually burning tissue unintentionally. And part of the reason is because due to the camera and the television screen, the surgeon only has a limited view of the surgical field. So we want to try to provide some kind of feedback so that the surgeon actually knows what's happening off screen. So our objective was to enable surgeons to know when they are cauterizing tissue. This means that the tool tip is in contact with tissue, that current is actually conducting through the tissue to burn it, and that they are actually burning tissue. So we want to provide this feedback using vibrotactile feedback in order to inform surgeons when they are burning tissue. And we believe that vibrotactile feedback is a better option than, than audio feedback or visual feedback because we're replacing the tactile cues that are being lost due to the nature of the laparoscopic tool with another form of tactile cues. We believe this has potential to improve the safety of laparoscopic monopolar electrocautery by providing an intuitive way to the surgeon to know when they're actually cauterizing tissue. So to achieve these goals that Anna just outlined, we created a device. It's comprised of two components. On your left, you'll see the signal processor component. You can think of this as kind of the electrocautery detector. This is actually gathering information about the system, where it then analyzes it and transmits it to the feedback component on your right. And this is the part of the system that actually delivers uh, information back to the surgeon. So Anna walked you through the electrocautery circuit, and here it is again. Um, you see the generator to the tooltip, ground pad and back. So the signal processor is placed between the ground pad and the generator and it analyzes the signal and transfers it to the feedback component. So here you see it in a surgical mock-up. Um, first you have the signal processor. So the wire that runs from the ground pad back to the generator is run through a current sense inductor on the signal processor. And I'll get to this a little bit more in a minute. It then communicates wirelessly with the feedback component strapped to the surgeon's arm. From this, two small wires transfer current to the actuator placed on the tool handle. And an actuator is just a vibrating motor, and this is actually the source of the vibrational feedback. So walking you through how the signal processor actually works. As current flows through the wire, going from the ground pad to the generator, 
When it's run through the current of its inductor, a secondary current is induced in the current of its inductor that is then transferred to the rest of the system. And this is really important because we're not interfering with the original system or the original signal, so we're protecting the safety of the patient and <coughs> letting the surgeon know that their device is still reliable. This, this signal is then filtered by hardware components to prepare it for use in the microcontroller, and we use the Arduino platform for this device. Um, it then analyzes th this data and decides whether or not to deliver a vibrational response. Uh, this is then wirelessly transmitted to the other part of the other component of our system. So here you see current profiles. These are this is basically the signal coming straight from the from the current of the inductor before any filtering. So up top is when the surgeon is pressing the cut button but not actually making contact with tissue. Down below, you see when he's pressing the cut button and making contact. The thing to really note here is the increase in the magnitude of the current. And after a lot of trial and error, we determined that this was the best indication of the occurrence of electric cautery, and therefore the deliver, delivery of vibrotactile feedback. So now, once that signal is analyzed, it's wirelessly transmitted to the feedback component on the surgeon's arm. The microcontroller then takes this data and decides whether or not to send a signal to the actuator, a vibrating motor, on the tool handle. So when the surgeon is touching tissue and electrocauterizing, uh, vibrotactile feedback is delivered to the tool handle. So now we're going to show you a quick demo of our device. Um, one thing to note that throughout our project, we utilize steak in order to simulate human tissue, since our design is proof of concept. Um, also note that in this demo, you can actually see the stake and see the cautery occurring, but as Anna mentioned before, in a true laparoscopic um, surgery setting, the surgeon would only have a 2D video to go off of. So throughout the entirety of the demo, the surgeon is uh, constantly activating the cautery, um, but note that the actuator on the tool handle only, comes, only vibrates um, when the tool actually comes in contact with the tissue, despite that the cautery is constantly being activated. So to address some key specifications, there were three important needs that we wanted to satisfy. The first being that the feedback component does not impair uh, the surgeon's normal use of the electrocautery. So in order to satisfy this need, one, we wanted to minimize the size of the feedback component. Note that of that 143 grams, less than 25 actually come from the actuator and the clip on the tool handle, and the rest of that mass is attributed to the microcontroller and the casing on the armband, as Zach explained earlier. And then secondly, in terms of vibration frequency and vibration <coughs> amplitude of the actuator, we wanted to choose an actuator that would deliver an appropriate strength vibration to deliver an accurate signal, but we didn't want to interfere with the surgeon's ability to cauterize accurately. So we selected values within the range of a normal cell phone frequency, and we were able to test these values using an accelerometer. Uh, secondly, we wanted the device to provide consistent feedback so the surgeon could use it as an accurate indicator of when he or she was actually touching a tissue. Um, so to satisfy this need, uh, we needed both the feedback component and the signal processor component to be able to withstand at least two hours of standby time and five minutes of cumulative cautery use. And additionally, we needed the vibrations of the actuator to be maintained within this time interval. So we wanted the amplitude of these vibrations to be within a range of plus or minus 10%. And for our prototype, we were able to achieve just a decrease of about 4%. And finally, uh, we wanted to minimize the time delay because we wanted to achieve as close to a real-time uh, feedback signal as possible. So we specify less than 700 milliseconds as our specification. And this is a sample graph of how we were able to calculate the time delay. Note that uh, the two plots are plotted simultaneously on the same time x-axis, and the upper blue plot uh, shows the cautery actually coming in contact with the tissue, while the red plot shows the oscillations of the actuator. So that first green line um, where the blue divot occurs shows when the tool actually first comes in contact with the tissue, and the second green line at the start of the oscillations is when the actuator starts vibrating. Um, and the difference between those two lines averaged over many iterations for both cut and coag, we achieved about 200 milliseconds, which is right at the lower bound of humor, human perceptibility for uh, a delay. And finally, our last need was that the device was easily implementable in the operating room. So again, we wanted to minimize size, which we were able to achieve. We also wanted um, both components to be battery powered, and we wanted communication to be wireless um, to minimize any excess wires in the surgical field. And then finally, we wanted to maintain the cost of our prototype under $1,000. And for our device, summing all the components of our prototype, we were able to achieve a cost of just $283. Right. Uh, though we were able to meet all of the uh, fundamental needs of our device, it was then important to evaluate whether or not our device would actually be use, uh, useful in either uh, training or clinical setting. 
Uh, so we conducted uh, a user study uh, using a range of individuals, ranging in experience from uh, fourth year medical students uh, all the way through uh, experienced surgeons. Uh, they were asked to complete a basic electric cautery simulation uh, and then were asked to fill out an evaluative uh, survey uh, to give us some feedback on our device. Uh, so this right here is an example of, or actually this is the actual survey uh, that the uh, surgeons were asked to complete uh, and we'll just highlight some key results from it. Uh, of the five subjects that we surveyed, all five liked the vibrotactile feedback component uh, that uh, our device gave. Uh, none of the five subjects felt that the uh, additional feedback given by the device impaired their use of the electric cautery tool, and four out of the five subjects noted that uh, they felt that the feedback improved their use of the tool. Uh, I'll just pull out a few key comments that were also collected over the course of the study. Uh, one surgical resident noted that while using our device to perform the electrocautery task, uh, the, it felt more similar to open surgery in which those tactile cues exist, so replacing those tactile cues that are lost uh, from laparoscopic procedures. Another surgical resident noted uh, that the, uh, it was a, our device is really good for positive reinforcement because a lot of uh, to, uh, reinforcement tools in medical simulation are negative. Uh, and lastly, an experienced surgeon noted that our device could potentially be very useful uh, for laparoscopic surgery. Uh, so in summary, uh, we were able to achieve our goal of uh, giving surgeons that uh, tactile feedback that they lose uh, due to using a laparoscopic tool and alerting them to when they're actually cauterizing tissue. Uh, uh, testing of our device was able to reveal that uh, uh, our device could potentially be useful for both uh, training and clinical applications. And uh, lastly, though our focus of our uh, survey and research was in laparoscopic tools, uh, our device is actually adaptable to both open and robotic types of surgery as well. Uh, so with respect to future directions, we've already filed a provisional patent application with the Center for Technology Transfer. Uh, and with some improvements that we hope to make with our device, uh, uh, would be pot potentially uh, making uh, adjustable strength of vibrations by adjusting the gain uh, based on the surgeon's preference. Uh, another possible improvement would be changing the location of vibration delivery. Uh, currently, vibration is delivered directly to the tool or handle, uh, but some surgeons noted during the survey uh, and the study that they would maybe prefer the vibration be delivered to their leg or their arm or some other location. Uh, and lastly, we'll work to more, uh, make our device more commercializable uh, by optimizing our components like the microcontroller uh, to be specifically geared uh, towards our device and also possibly printing circuitry to cut down on size. Uh, we'd li just like to take this time to acknowledge uh, some of the individuals that helped us along the way, namely Dr. Kuchenbecker, uh, Dr. Winkelstein, Dr. Risk, uh, Ted Gomez, who is a BE Class of 2008 alum, and several for all of their help. Uh, we'd now like to open up the floor to any questions you may have. also doing a master's in translational research who works in Dr. Guggenbecker's lab, our advisor, and he came up with, uh, with this idea last year. Um, so he and I were kind of looking at how important haptic feedback is in medical procedures and how a lot of it is lost with laparoscopic and robotic surgery. And currently there's really, there isn't a lot of haptic feedback, especially for electric pottery. There's no devices geared specifically towards electric pottery tools. So we wanted to try and find some kind of system that can improve the safety of electric pottery tools since there's nothing existing. I know another uh, major concern with uh, applying electric pottery is shunting of uh, the bogey power, whether it's tool and tool interaction, especially with laparoscopic. It seems like uh, this project could easily adapt with that application. Are you guys planning on just investigating that in the future? So we actually didn't. Uh, name this problem by, uh, you're talking about direct coupling more specifically. Um, so yeah, so that was actually one of the major advantages of our device versus some of uh, other devices that could give additional cues. So just for those of you that aren't as familiar with the direct coupling is when you have, um, you're conducting directly through another tool uh, into the tissue, uh, not the, the tool that you think that you're using. Uh, so this is a big problem, particularly in video laparoscopy because a lot of times the burning that results from direct coupling is out of the surgical view. So that is a big advantage of ours too, is that you are still getting feedback on the cautery, even if it's not within uh, the surgical field, or yeah, the view so of the surgical field. The tools are in a really uh, tight space because they're inserted into the abdominal cavity, and they're intersecting in various places, and 
although they really are insulated, a lot of times the tools get damaged, and then you do have the metal-to-metal -metal contact, which can then conduct the energy to another tool. And this is actually, that's the largest reason for complications currently in laparoscopic surgery. Um, and it can lead to death, because a lot of times it ends up rupturing the bowel. So, so we have time for All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> no, no one turned this on.